Um, so my background started out as I just graduated about a year ago um, with a bachelor's in graphic design and a bachelor's in mathematics. Uh, initially was going to go into math education, so teach math to high schoolers, but uh, I kind of really fell in love with design earlier on in high school and early in college, so I decided to give this path a try. Um, started out at Red Hat as an intern the summer after my sophomore year of college, um, and then kind of came back as an intern every summer after that, so three years an intern, one year a full-timer. Uh, so now I'm on the UXD team as a full-time visual designer. I'll just use the one I know works. Okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Stacy McAuliffe, and I'm a content strategist on our UX team. Um, I started off, I got my master's in professional writing. I have a bachelor's in fiction writing, um, and never thought that there would be a place in tech for me as a writer, but it turns out that there is. Um, so I started as a tech writer at IBM, and IBM went through this pretty massive design transformation. UX ended up being the forefront of everything that we did, um, and I found it super fascinating. Started working with the UX team more frequently on microcopy, copy in the UIs, and just discovered how important good content can be for UX um, to improve just user experience in general, um, and how helpful it was for me as a tech writer to understand user problems and the business problems that we were trying to solve um, so that I could write better documentation, um, and started as the UX writer and content strategist at Red Hat about a year and a half ago. That's it. Hi, so um, I'm Sarah Chizari. I'm a UX researcher. I have been working with the team for about three years now. Um, I started as a computer science student, like um, I was a bachelor in computer science, and then I sh shifted my focus to human-computer interaction in my master's degree. Um, then I started working as an instructional designer, uh, where, um, so where I was um, supposed to design like course materials for students that I had no idea who they are and if this material is going to work for them. So that was the kind of inspiration for me to switch to user experience research where um, I wanted to learn about the users and how things we design is going to work for them and how they perceive it. So that's why I started doing my PhD in human computer interaction and information science and I took my PhD and I became a researcher. Um, the PhD took me about five years and it's been about three years that I've been working as a UX researcher with the team. That's about me. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to give a brief, oops, brief information about our team. Uh, Red Hat UXD team right now is about 106 people. Um, in, I joined in 2014, and at that point we had 18 people, so it's been a huge change over the last uh, five years. And it's interesting that our group is actually 50-50 men and one versus women, so it's, pretty, it's a pretty cool place to be. Um, we have some pre like listed questions that I, we're going to ask first and then we'll open it up to the audience if people have any other questions. So I'm going to start with what does it take to be perceived as open source UX? And I'm going to ask Kat that question.
have those conversations and, and defend those designs, but also get feedback and suggestions from folks in the community or developers or even internally across our, our hundred or so folks on, on the UX UX screen set. So it's helped us collaborate both internally and externally by embracing the, the open source. Thank you. The next question is about um, how have you contributed to an open source project? So I'm not sure how much of you guys know about Red Hat, but we have a, an open source design system, which is Patternfly, which all of our group is actually always in, um, included in. So that's one aspect of open source. But I'm wondering if Gina could start by answering that. Sure. Um, research so what I um, only do at Red Hat or any other jobs that I got as a researcher is just to get feedback or collect feedback from users so in the context of open uh, open source um, things are a bit different than other contexts so there are two uh, maybe three major projects that I've worked on so far, open source ones. Uh, one is the pattern fly one that um, that um, Gina and Colleen mentioned. Um, for pattern fly, I, what I do is basically um, try to see what community says. So, and the difference between open source and other companies is that as a researcher, you gotta um, like the research request mainly comes from the product manager or the designer. They first come to you and say, okay, I have these questions and I want to know the answers. So, in open source, we have that. Like that's one part of it. But the other major part is that a lot of these feedback or some of these requests are coming from the communities. So the community of designers or developers specifically for Patternfly, they, they adopt Patternfly in their own way, they use it in their own way, and they as users, they come to us and say, okay, we used it and these are the issues that we found, so can you guys um, 
like you know dig more into it and see what we can do about it. So I think the difference for me, like as a researcher in open source, was this type of interaction. So getting direct feedback from the community uh, and those first-hand experience from the customers or the users were the most uh, I think valuable ones to, to me at least because I know they are real and these are not the thing that we guesstimate. Those are real um, problems that the, that people in the community um, encountered and that's what um, we have to focus on because that came from real people. Um, I think that's, that's a little bit about research with Pattern Fly. Thank you. The next question is how can you get involved in open source projects based on your background? Sarah, I don't know if you want to continue with that one. Working, yeah. Okay. So, um, how you can um, get involved? So, again, um, when it comes to research, all I care about is feedback from users. So, if you guys, like, if any of you guys are interested in research, one thing you can do is just to become the researcher uh, while being a user. So, basically, what I do as a researcher is that I talk to users and see what are the problems. But, uh, and the, basically, the feedback comes from the user. So. If you are one of those users, the best thing you could do is just um, share your feedback, like share whatever experience you have uh, with the with the product, with the, whatever you're doing, um, with with the rest of the community, and see what they think of. So that's the best way of actually. Um, doing the research, like, you know, being community-oriented, see if you are the only person who has a problem or if there's any other person having the same problem, and try to do your own research to see what was wrong, and um, and then just try to, to, to make it visible to the team who actually built that thing. So, again, specifically with Patternfly, we have GitHub, so people can just go in and just add in issues that they encountered. That's one way of getting involved with research so just just sharing the feedback that you had with the experience that's that's wonderful I would say um, there are so many other communication methods that we have we have this mailing list we have uh, pattern fly uh, forum we have pattern fly slack this is uh, like open to public so um, I would say the main part of research is gathering feedback and you guys like whoever is the user sharing the feedback with the community is the most valuable part of it and um, so instead of me going to the user asking them to share the feedback with me if they do it themselves it's just like it's just easier job for me basically and it's just much more valuable because it's coming directly from them so I would say um, get involved share your experience don't be shy honestly if you encounter something um, um, the, main, the main thing I try to do whenever I do research is that um, I tell the participant that you are not the focus of this study or research, the, the focus is to understand the usability of the product. So if something is not working for you, it's not, it doesn't mean that you have some problem or it's, it's you that have the lack of knowledge. It's most probably the product that we developed um, has some problems. So feel free to share anything that comes to your mind. And again, um, that's the best type of feedback that you could, that we could actually gather. So don't be shy and just speak out and just share whatever experience that you have. Okay, thanks. Stacey, do you want to share? Try to answer that as well. So again, as a writer, um, I would never have thought of open source as a place that like needed my skill set, but it is definitely an awesome place if you're a writer to contribute. Um, open source is all about community, getting people involved, getting people invested, um, and I think the messaging around your project can help draw people in. I think if you're a writer, you can help in so many ways. You can help clarify messaging for projects. You can help improve documentation and help improve usage for the projects. Um, I just think, as a writer, anywhere that you see areas that are confusing, I didn't understand what to do next. Um, if you have a skill set in technical writing, helping with processes and procedures on the website can be super helpful. Um, and just like Sarah said, like don't get nervous. Uh, I think the teams are super receptive to any help with writing because especially I know developers are not 
really amped a lot of the time to <laughs> to write. It's not their favorite thing. Um, obviously, not in all cases, but um, yeah, I think if you have writing chops and you're noticing things that can be improved, um, you can absolutely help in, in that area. Mary? Yeah, so I'm actually going to take a step back and think about this from the non-pattern pl pattern fly perspective. Um, so my first two years interning here, I was on a super technical engineering team, so I was on the Fedora engineering team. Um, so finding a place that was kind of like my sweet space as like a more visual, graphical person was not exactly an easy feat. Um, so I had to do a little bit of digging in order to find kind of where I could make use in that open source population. So I think, you know, beyond pattern flying, beyond actual just straight up design resources, really any upstream community, especially in open source, you know, we all kind of know that open source isn't exactly known for having the most beautiful user interfaces. A lot of times they would really benefit from having someone take a look at some of those components for them. Um, so, you know, whether it's upstreams that are, you know, specific to an app, so everything that Red Hat does, it starts out as, you know, an open source project first. So all of us work within those groups, but uh, even, you know, Fedora was an open source operating system, but in order to be that, it needed to gain speed, and they had marketing events, so they had an entire design team that was pretty much all international, um, and gave a really good opportunity to kind of communicate with people who I wouldn't normally get design feedback from, and that's a really unusual place to find design opportunities, I think, when you actually look deep into the tech and realize that sometimes they have a need that they don't always uh, advertise as well. So there is, you know, this marketing need, this need for helping them build out their brand. Um, so from a graphics perspective, that was a cool space for me to find. Um, and like everyone said, a lot of these upstream communities, uh, because they're always looking for more contributors, they have a lot of ways to get in touch with them. I think sometimes finding out how to get in touch with, you know, the groups that you want to do design work for, content writing for, can be a really hard first step. But, you know, if you just go right to the root, even if it's just fedoraproject.org, you know, you can see they have all these ways to get in contact. And chances are if you just contact someone, whoever's on the receiving side of that mailing list or, uh, you know, just on the receiving side of something, even a tweet, there's probably someone out there who could send you the, this big chain of, to go talk to this person who knows this person who might somehow know a design person you'll get there and you'll learn and meet some really cool people along the way great thanks the next question is how does communication and open source differ so gina do you want to start with that one Okay. All right. I guess. Okay. All right. I'm going to go now. Um, so <laughs> uh, communication and open source. Um, I think in a lot of ways, the actual things that you're communicating are the same as they would be at, you know, any proprietary company. You know, you're still collaborating with others. You're, just, you're still, you know, figuring out where everyone's at so that you can come to the best solution. But I think how that collaboration communication 
works and how open the pipelines are are a little bit different in open source. Um, so we always joke about uh, memo list and how rare it is at an open source company for people to kind of not have to gauge what they say as much. And you know, you can kind of say things and you know voice opinions that you otherwise might be a little bit more uh, censored to say before. So I think you get much more like raw information and raw thoughts from people, which at first can be jarring, but you end up res you end up getting a stronger result because you have true like you know valid opinions from people, not ones where people you know were tiptoeing around their, what they actually thought. Um, and I think also with open source not being you know this confined, here's the only people that I talk to. In open source, we have the ability to communicate with everyone, so you get the perspectives of people that you normally wouldn't get. Um, and both within the UX team and the previous team I was on, you know, a lot of the populations of people were not, had a culture really, really differently than mine. So I think even that cultural piece is really interesting to think about with the communication. Um, even how people communicate based on their culture is different. Um, the amount of like directness versus indirect communication was interesting to see. And I think just a good skill to learn, which I think, um, you know, is a result of the open source culture overall. Like, I don't think I would have been able to effectively communicate with people who communicated differently than me if it wasn't for open source, kind of forcing me to look a little bit deeper and ask really concise questions and ask people questions that may have seemed kind of stupid <laughs> um, to them, but it, I think, proved helpful in actually getting to the root of things. So I think that having no limit to who and where and how you're communicating with people is a big differentiating factor between open source and non-open source uh, workplaces. Stacy, did you have anything else to add? Yeah. So I, I'm going to take a little bit of a different approach to answering the question. And one of the things that I do for Patternfly is help with uh, communicating with the community. So blogging. Um, and I've found, compared to some of the proprietary companies that I've worked for, communications for an open source project, it's so much more important to communicate rationale, communicate decision making, communicate everything that you're doing in a way that supports open collaboration and feedback from the community. Um, and then also really being sensitive to the fact that you have this community of folks who are super invested in what you've been doing. And there are going to be times where not everybody agrees with decisions that have been made. So um, I think blogging has been very interesting. And then also the messaging on our website, um, just again, being super sensitive sensitive to the fact that it's a community, we want people involved, we want feedback, we want everybody to have their hands in it and have accountability and be invested in it. Um, and I think it just does impact all the messaging and other ways that we talk about everything that we, we put into the, into the universe, into the community. Thanks. And, and Sarah, can you articulate the differences between working in open source and non-open source? It seems like your previous job is much different than Red Hat.
Um, I think we're going to open it up to any questions from the audience, if anybody has any questions. I think it's too late. <laughs> um, can I keep that down? You guys will use this one. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering if you the trends between what you have and then trying to prioritize from that. Is that do you want to expand on that? Yeah. So, so um, what we usually do is just to do research based on the feedback we got. So it, it's not like uh, we take all the feedback and we act on every single of them. So usually we take in the feedback and um, we try to go back to the rest of the community and the rest of the users and see what's the prevalence there. So it's not just like, um, and it's not, it's not going to be feasible, honestly. You can't actually act on every single feedback that you get from the community. The best I would recommend is just to do your own research on the feedback you got. Not, doesn't mean that that feedback is not usable, is not good. It just, um, for the sake of uh, prioritization and just making sure that you are on track and the strategy you're taking uh, makes sense to uh, everyone on the team and the product team and also the community, it's best to do your own research based on like using the feedback you got. So usually what we do, um, any feedback that comes from the community, um, um, whoever received it, they share it with me. And um, I try to go and just write a test plan based on the feedback we got to see, like basically to address the exact question or the problem that the user brought up. And then we're going to look at, yeah, where was the, what's, what's the prevalence really out there? Like, yeah, this group of people thought it's, this is a problem, but is that a problem for the rest of the community or the rest of the users? So, um, and there are lots of ways you can do it. It's not just like, um, so the feedback you get might be just a small piece of yeah, text or quality feedback. But you can take that feedback and put it in different contexts, in different uh, using different methods. You can either continue talking to other users in the community. You can put that question or like, um, like frame that question into a survey and send it to a much larger population. Um, there's so many different things that you, I mean, so many different methods that you can try just to um, to understand what's the prevalence mainly and how how 
how important that issue is. Um, just a bit of commercial. If you guys are interested to know what type of research we do, what are the methods that you can try, definitely come check out our booth um, in the exhibition hall. There are at least like seven or eight research activities going on there. So it's a really great way to just um, get some exposure to what type of research I'm talking about. Um, a lot of con there's going to be a lot of engagement, a lot of um, conversation between the researcher and the user, and again, a great I think, um, experience just to see how we do research in open source. But yeah, my, I would say my only recommendation would be just do another round of research based on the feedback you got and just see what's the frequency or what's, what's how, how important that issue is. Yeah, I think it's also interesting because open source has so many people that are so passionate that if you even just hold one usability study with one customer, it's like you could almost be convinced by what they're saying to you because they're so passionate, but like making sure that all gets put into perspective is really important. Anybody else want to answer? No. Thank you. Any other questions? Hey guys. Um, great panel. Uh, one of the things that I've been curious about in the thoughts and notes and which one of the when I look at some of the frameworks that are out there that really I think help to really bring the UX forward. They, they often, though, are kind of the they're, they're getting better, they're becoming slightly larger objects that capture more common interactions. But what I think is lacking right now is something that's helping people in open source to get a good information architecture. Right? So, and it's, it's easy for me to throw a lot of controls on the screen. It's not very easy for me to throw a lot of controls on the screen in a same way that there's consistency throughout the application, and there's that kind of element of discoverability that some people can be successful early on with a good specifically to information architecture, but I know, so what we've tried to do in Patternfly with Patternfly 4 is recraft our design documentation so that we're not only putting components out there, but we're creating documentation that helps you understand what patterns you should use, where, and why you might use them. So why would I use like a list versus a table? Why would I use this chart versus that chart? Um, so kind of helping designers and developers have more of an understanding of the rationale behind why you would choose a specific design pattern over another. And just a shameless plug for content. <laughs> We're also, we put um, content guidelines in for Patternfly, so how to write better for user experience, how to write better for components. Um, and I do help that, I think that that helps with um, discoverability, uh, encouraging people to think about content and design with words. I think that helps just naturally with information architecture architecture when you're considering language first, like how does my user understand this problem? Um, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. All right. So this is a perfect Todd question. Thank you, Todd. Um, so if we if we knew how to give everybody perfect information architectures as a UX industry, um, there'd be a whole lot of way more usable applications out there. So um, I think as an industry, that is. Um, that's part of the value that uh, UX practice brings, and I don't think there is a one-size-fits-all solution. Um, it really depends on the application you're building, um, who the users are, what they're trying to accomplish, and that's how you have to organize your information, and that's the special sauce. So I don't think we can build that into a pattern library in any way, shape, or form. Yeah, I was just going to say, I, I, similarly, I think we've tried to tackle it a little bit from the 
UX perspective, but at the at the product level almost to try to do not as much a one size fits all, but provide some type of conventions that that almost sit on top of the the design library. So you you know you have a pattern fly where it's at the component level and you're using these standards. So look and feel, you know, it's it's the same across products, but you also have something that sits on top of that design system where you have conventions that are really specific to a product, and we're trying to really do a better job of documenting those conventions at the product level to say, uh, here's the cases where we use a modal versus a in-page form, or here's when we use a, a wizard um, versus a progressive form type of thing. Here's what our toolbars look like in this product for these views. So kind of getting more specific, uh, not to say that these those other views aren't great maybe for another product, but uh, I think providing some type of documentation, especially in the open source community, uh, kind of your, your conventions to explain to help somebody who's trying to contribute stay within that framework. I think you do have to, yeah, document some of that um, and pro provide those guidelines. But yeah, it's, it's hard with just a component, I, I agree. Yeah, and I was just going to say, it's also, I think, the industry is changing so quickly. Like, a lot of times, we're just trying to get products out to market and make it usable. So, at, you know, at some level, we have to make a best guess at the beginning to get something out to market quickly. There's other areas of the product where we might be able to spend more time, and we have more ability to create a better than to end experience, but it, it's not always like that, right? Okay, so I'm a researcher, so obviously um, my answer to any question is just to do research. So, um, but honestly in this context, this is a really good question because, um, so yeah, there are a lot of frameworks out there, or a lot of, um, say, like heuristics or a lot of, um, say, you know, best practices and design guidelines out there. And a lot of the things that we introduce in Pattern Flow are based on those. Um, but my recommendation would be, yes, those are the things that we thought will work for many people or for many users, but they're not tested in multiple different contexts. So honestly, what you need to do is just, yeah, as, as soon as you adopted this framework, you will need to do your own research to see so you're in your own context, does that does that make sense? So um, yeah, my recommendation would be just again just do research um, because not no, we can't actually test this component in every possible context that would exist out there. This is not possible. And um, an in context experience could be really different than out of context experience for sure. So um, all of these recommendations are mostly out of context recommendations. So definitely do research um, in context to see if these things that we recommend that worked in your context and get back to us. I mean, if it doesn't work, let us know and that would be really nice feedback for us too. I think we can take one. Can we take one more? I can't see now. Is that a zero? I think that's a zero. Okay. Well, thanks everybody for attending. If you guys want to talk to us, well, most of us are going to be in the UXD booth uh, throughout Saturday. So feel free to drop by and, and check us out, check out the group. Thanks very much. Thanks.